there's something just more valuable to a good and just existence than say just existence alone, right? This kind of sanctity of life, this humanitarian sanctity of life, there's always something more than that and that's justice itself, right? And in seeking that justice, whether it's in, which is beyond life and death, whether your life or someone else's life, the martyr transforms himself. And in this context, in our context, I think this transformation is what it means to be, uh, is to be a traitor of the white race, right? That's the abolitionist project. start off with uh, a hometown hero, this James Boggs up there, right? And uh, I wanted to read a quote from him. The horizons of which the revolution in America opens up are more tremendous than anywhere else in the world. But the path which the revolution will have to take in this country is also more difficult and vicious than anywhere else in the world. First, it is the warfare state with huge forces that have to be challenged. And second, Inside each American from top to bottom in various degrees has been accumulated all the corruption of a class society which has achieved its magnificent technological progress first and always by exploiting the Negro race and then by exploiting the immigrants of all races. The struggle to rid themselves and each other of this accumulated corruption is going to be more painful and violent than any struggle over purely economic grievances have been or likely will be. That was James Boggs in 1963. And I pulled it out because I, I think it's kind of amazing how, how it captures the task that's in front of us today. And he identifies the immensity of the problem of revolutionary change far better than I think any academic or civil rights leader. And you know, he's a factory worker uh, by trade, right? And this is the same question that I tried to tackle and how it might should be done. And I was never confident to offer any solutions. So what I tried to do was just frame some questions, facilitate discussion, et cetera. Um, so I guess, well, I'll be referencing a lot of people who have kind of worked on the project, right? It's kind of opened up to other people. And if you guys want to chime in, go ahead. We can make it more conversational. Uh, in fact, the quote, uh, the Boggs quote is from a text that Jason Smith wrote recently as like a year reflection after the rebellion on Boggs' American Revolution, which is excellent, right? Um, it still amazes me how I think he, in 63, he anticipates Italian autonomy in the 70s, just fully, right? And now still there's so many people studying post operismo but he's got it in 1963. Um, also, I wanted to note that Boggs seems to suggest that the complications that are posed by a revolution in America also is due to how much is riding on it. And, and this needs to also be put in the forefront of it, is that radical transformation here in the States you know, has opens up unforeseen possibilities for the rest of the world, right? The rest of the world has America's imperialist boot on its neck, right? So that task is also uh, thrown in front of us. It makes it ever more difficult, all right? Let's see, boom. Okay, so I tried to bring, this is the original flyer for how it might should be done, uh, made by a, a graphic designer who's doing a lot of posters during the uprising. Um, so it was supposed to be the first slide. I'm going to go through some of the slides that we never got to show because uh, literally a riot had hit the place the day before. So I was really amazed that the comrades got it together to get the video equipment up and the microphone up because it was tore up out there, right? And you know, it was also in the encampment and there was so much trash and stuff. So they did a great job of getting everything, the microphone set up and everything, but they couldn't get the slides working. And this would have been the first slide. So, oh, what am I doing? Boom, there we go. All right, so that kid comes back. So I guess I'll just start off with the first one and I'll elaborate on them. And if there's more you wanna hear, just let me know. Um, so if you were out there in the night, some of you probably were out there, hopefully you guys are out there, you guys know it went down, all right? And that is to say, in the, in the slogan that goes around a lot is a militant nationwide uprising did in fact occur, all right? But nevertheless, they're talking heads that'll go on about the mostly peaceful character of the protest and you know, but it's easier, it's becoming easier and easier to confirm that, you know, in the most remote corners of America, it really kicked off, right? And here's, a, I, uh, I put a picture of, this is a chart of the protests, and of course, some of them may have been peaceful, but 
there were a lot where, you know, things got a little ill. And, um, you know, for example, in, in, in the strangest places, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, all right, they attacked the mall, Reno, Nevada, they burned cop cars and burnt down the city hall from the inside, which is a little sketchy, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in both cases, the governor has declared states of emergency and activated the National Guard. Davenport, Iowa. Davenport, Iowa. You know, two cities in Iowa went down in Davenport. They had a shootout with the cops. It escalated to that. So, you know, it's really kind of just backwards to say that, you know, there's a mostly peaceful character. In, in Michigan, I mean, more happened here than I can even recount looking through it. I was like, wow, all right. So I think it's important for us to consider why and how much, why so much of what we witness firsthand can be just denied outright to us. Um, also too, I believe there were martyrs in Michigan as well, right, during the uprising. So, you know, uh, our honor to them means that we have to recognize what happened. Um, so to some degree, I think this spectacular misrepresentation of the George Floyd uprising as a kind of peaceful non-event, right, can be explained by what DeBoer called in comments and comments on society spectacle, forgeries without reply, all right? And I'm gonna qu quote DeBoer here. Um, the simple fact of being without reply has given to the false an entirely new quality. At a stroke, it is truth which has almost ceased to exist, or at best has been reduced to the status of a pure hypothesis that can never be demonstrated. And DeBoer argued in comments that, you know, the spectacle had achieved this kind of sophistication now that it can declare that when something did not happen, it therefore did not happen, all right? Uh, but I think actually the present situation, and I, I typically will always agree with Guy DeBoer and we can talk about this, but uh, I think the situation requires like a bit more nuance. And so I took the lead from a, a Greek theoretical group called Flesh Machine and Ego de Provoco. They put out a book at, in 2010 about the Greek uprising. And what they did was they tried to chart the way different political positions uh, produce different discourses about violence. And each of them had a different kind of counterinsurgent effect. So one of their main, uh, and, and Alan Badu's Logic of Worlds had just been published then. So that, that was the, kind of their main uh, theoretical background for their project. And so I tried to do that with the first thesis. So on the one hand, Badu, he separates what he calls the reactive integration of the event, right? And this is the position that's gonna be taken up by liberals, um, progressives, everyone from say the center to certain sections of the left, right? And the aim of that discourse is to downplay the significance of the uprising by passing it off as kind of a civil, orderly protest, et cetera, et cetera, right? So why is this done? This is done to reaffirm and reassert that an event occurred, but not an event that's a radical break, right? So it can be, uh, so revolt can't be furthered and the possibilities for change are redirected back into the status quo, all right? So as with all liberal democratic reformists, you know, I, the, the, the slogan I say is like, they change things just a little so that they don't change at all, right? And this is the, that's the one side, the kind of progressive side, the strategy of reform and denial. The other hand is what Baudu calls the occultation of the event, right? And this is kind of the fascist response to the rebellion from Trump to the right, to the far right, to the alt right, whatever right you want, Fox News, et cetera, et cetera. So in the occultation of the event, um, they have to acknowledge that an uprising did occur. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, the, the right is just obsessed with Black Lives Matter, right? Into these kind of like, uh, even to exaggerated forms, but they were the ones who said, okay, yeah, there is an uprising going on during this and after, right? Um, so they had to recognize that an uprising did jump off because they want to violently oppress it, right? The fascists are the ones out in the street and want to, and want to bring it down. So Badu argues that the drive to kind of crush and fully extinguish an event is always done on the basis of some sort of transcendental idea or standard. And this could be an immutable notion of say law and order, he argues, but in the American context, it could be something like white supremacy or the American settler colonialist project, but in their positive light of it, like the American dream or whatever bullshit. All right. um, so uh, later in an interview with Gerardo Munoz, I, I tried to, uh, uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to where that interview was published, right? There's a journal called Revista de Senso that comes out of Chile. And there's a lot of activity in Chile with their insurrection of trying to be, I've been trying to foster kind of connections with them. So they put out a new theoretical journal that, you know, kind of is the, uh, that's fed by the movement, but it's a theoretical journal. And I did an interview with Gerardo Munoz in there, and I tried to argue that uh, 
that these kind of liberal delusions now about violence and insurrection, they're almost going to the point, especially after, uh, after the January 6th storming of the Capitol, they've gotten to the point where the liberals almost deny violence to the extent that, say, the right has these conspiratorial fantasies of QAnon, right? Uh, you know, you could like, uh, it's really hard to deny that certain things happen. So, you know, it's almost a delusional point. Um, also, I wanted to also point out that the mass looting that's been going on the past few weeks, right? I think this is a good example of it as well, right? Uh, the Italian, I like better, the Italian autonomous tradition calls it collective auto reduction, but this is obviously uh, in response to the Rittenhouse verdict, right? And it's been going on for a week and it keeps being depoliticized by the state and by the media and uh, kind of separated from the actual political revolt that it's attached to. Boom. So there we go. <laughs> So in thesis two, you know, I wanted to emphasize that there's something very unique about the black experience in America that was exemplified in the uprising. Or, uh, and I mean, it sounds like a PBS special, the black experience in America, but you know, there's something I think very unique that uh, was shown there, that was shown there. And I don't think it's what it's been really, the finger's been put on it well, and I'm still working on trying to uh, articulate it, but how I tend to see these things is on the one side, you have America, and I keep calling it like this vast and desolate wasteland. In EndNotes, I recently put out an article or about mark the anniversary of the revolt called like civilizing the American wasteland. And I, I tend to think of the citizens of America, especially um, as De Boer thought of the planetary petty bourgeois, as you like to call them, right? And I'll quote, he would describe them as something like deprived of freedom, tolerating every abuse, subject to humiliation, cramped in gloomy, ugly, and unhealthy habitations, ill-nourished with tasteless, tasteless and adulterated food, poorly treated for constantly reoccurring illnesses, under continual petty surveillance, maintained in modern illiteracy and superstitions that reinforce the power of their masters, end quote, all right? So, uh, and this is kind of the switch of privileged discourse, right? You know, uh, I think there's this underlying, uh, especially if you read Mick, Petty, uh, Peggy McIntosh, like, something that uh, in a weird way, I'd argue that there's times where it seems to imply that, you know, black people want these advantages that white people have. And I always try to switch this around and use what DeBoer said in Ingiram, right? He has a scathing indictment of what he calls like the salaried masses, spectacular salaried masses of the petty bourgeois of France. And uh, he just thinks of them as really lowly. Um, so, and I, I apply this to all America and say something that, say something like this country is completely antithetical to anything that's like the good life or eudaimonia. So, and more so it, it's allergic to fine arts, literature, this comes up a lot. It's allergic to love, it's against communism, everything that matters in the world, America stands as opposed to, right? So then on the other side, you have black Americans as the avant-garde in, in this formulation. And so what I argue, at least in the talk is that they were responsible for everything in the country that's valuable, every contribution, you know, and I, I really, beginning, I get this from uh, um, Cornell West, right, uh, in his book about philosophy, the philosophical tradition in America, but uh, I think it goes further than that, and so all these valuable contributions that the country neglects even go as far as the, the fine arts, right, Ahmad Jamal, the pianist, right, I think he lived in Detroit for some time, is that right? Someone correct me. Okay, yeah, he did. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, he's from Pittsburgh, but I think he moved here, I think he loved it here, all right. Um, so he would call jazz. He would said, I, I'm not going to refer to it as jazz. This is American classical music. And I think he's right in the sense that jazz is the only music that can stand on par with European art music or classical music. It's the only thing that's really what that was made. That's really, that's, uh, significant in the American context. So in this way, I think the black role was a spearhead in the rebellion, but they were also in, in, in being like uh, at the forefront of the rebellion. They're also in a, or we're also in a sort of civilizing mission as I like to call it sometimes. So for this reason, I also found it factually false and ideologically spurious to misrepresent summer of 2020 as a purely black uprising, right? I mean, for starters, if you were out there, you saw all the different people out there, right? We all know in both the day and the night, it was very mixed. Second, the rebellion itself was nothing other than the kind of overcoming of these state imposed divisions, all right? So as Agamben astutely adjud uh, judged in his chapter on Tiananmen, and I've written about this elsewhere, but it's impossible to ascribe a kind of legible demand or goal onto the uprising 
or the movement in Tiananmen or the movement that we saw in the summer of 2020, right? So, uh, I mean, Summer's Uprising was not about passing some sort of anti-racist legislation that was gonna land on some bureaucrat's desk, right? So, and, you know, die a stillborn death on that bureaucrat's desk. So what occurred was what we saw on the streets, right? What it was doing, it didn't have a goal, it didn't have a telos, right? But we saw the concrete overcoming of boundaries as it played out, the alienation that separates us from each other. And Agamemnon refers this as whatever singularity, uh, as a human that's cast off its predicates. And for him, this is the strength of the movement, having no demands, you know, the breaking down of identity. And the state, on the other hand, always works to reinscribe identities back into the domain of capture of the state. So uh, this is what I was trying to aim at here. You know, this is what the Black avant-garde was initiating. Uh, so you have this kind of clash between the state and the non-state, or this Agamemnon says the state versus humanity, right? And I see the Black avant-garde as kind of having this role of sort of initiating the civilizing process that demonstrates what humanity really is in the most inhumane country in the world, so. Um, well, this is a long one. Um, and this basically, I, I switched around the order a little bit. This is kind of saying the same thing. It's using some of constructs from both Agamben and, and Badu. Uh, you know, basically what I want to say is that, you know, uh, identity politics is overcome here. And, uh, you know, there's some part that's no, that's not a part of the American wasteland that's changing, that's working to change it, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll go to the, this one, the one that people want to talk about, all right. Um, so identity politics and, and, and this part, all right. So this is split into two parts, this, this thesis. There's the one hand, on the one hand, there's the critique of identity politics, intersectionality and social privilege discourse. And on the other hand, there's what I call the morbid libidinal economy. So the first part of the project, it comes from work I've done with uh, John Clegg as a scholar of prison and slavery at University of Chicago. And I won't go through all the statistics that he's been working on and all the empirical data that he's collected, that's his side of the project. But I wanna give a basic sketch of some of the arguments that I was trying to put forward against uh, intersectionality. So, and to start with in the beginning, you know, to some sense with intersectionality, you have to, in a very basic level, it's obviously true, right? It's just, uh, it's correct in some very basic fundamental level. But if we follow Kimberly Crenshaw's original line of reasoning, you know, then we could say something like, yes, there is something very unique about a person who's simultaneously being held between two intersecting oppressions. Um, but in a way that's tautologically correct, right? Yes, it's unique, but what are we going to derive from this, right? And you have certain crude models of intersectionality, which will argue whether implicitly or explicitly that oppression, multiple oppressions entail, you know, more oppression, something more than uniqueness, right? So namely, it, but, you know, of course, this is, this doesn't really follow to say that multiple oppressions means more oppressed, right? Um, the other problem, which I think occurs in both, in the, both the crude and the refined models of intersectionality is that they'll argue that this kind of intersectional position, this position at the conjuncture between two oppressions, uh, that, that this specific place, this location in, in this kind of, uh, in, this, in this kind of conjuncture, this joint or this uh, crossing is what confers agency into a subject, right? And I also think this is incorrect, all right? This, is, this doesn't follow. Um, just because a group is situated at the crossing point of two forms of domination, it doesn't make that person or that group more equipped to fight one oppression, the other oppression, or both oppressions, all right? Um, typically, intersectionality is contested from some sort of class first perspective, all right? This is not what I'm doing, all right? I always wanna make that clear, all right? Um, in fact, in, in, the, in the talk, I argued that Marx makes the same mistakes that, that intersectionality makes, right? Um, this is two, he has several formulations of the proletariat, right? It goes throughout, his life in different times. There's some that are really good, but you know he makes the same mistakes often uh, at other times, right? He, there's times where he says the proletariat is the most oppressed, therefore it's the one, the revolutionary subject, false, right? Uh, there's times where he says the, the proletariat is located on the levers of production, therefore it's the revolutionary subject, also probably false now, right? Um, so what I was trying to do is a more of an imminent critique of intersectionality itself to show that it can achieve the aims that it sets out to do for itself. Um, as for privilege theory, uh, I should fix something. If you guys saw the talk, some of the, some of you saw the talk in the, in your class, but 
I argued that, you know, a psychological component has been added to it after the fact. I, you know, Du Bois does give, uh, he does talk about a psychological wage of whiteness, right? Nevertheless, you know, I don't think he would, uh, I don't think, uh, okay, better put, right? You know, the psychologically, psychology of, of the wages of whiteness has been morphed into what Peggy McIntosh talks about, you know, about chewing with your mouth open, right? And most importantly, it becomes uh, this kind, uh, this sort of way to wallow in psychological guilt. So, you know, um, rest in peace to Nolik Nadiev. He once said, I remember before he died, that he wanted to give up the term race altogether because it's been abused so much, right? And I'm starting to think that, you know, he should have said that about privilege, even though that was his idea, right? So I tried to go back into the, the more revolutionary lineage of, of privilege and look at Harry Haywood and Theodore Allen, and Nolik Nadiev, who all knew each other and who were working in this uh, direction. And what's important for me is that their formulation of privilege theory entailed that white workers have to strike alongside black workers. They have to recognize that their real alliances aren't with the white bourgeois, but with black workers and strike alongside and solidarity with them to recognize that they share the same class enemy, all right? And this comes out to something much different than the crap you get in a diversity training, right? Which really promotes inaction, all right? But I still think there's something really sketchy with the idea in general. It has a lot of pitfalls. Um, lastly, identity politics, all right? This is the hardest one I think to deal with, right? I've been messing with this for, for like a decade now, but I think it's really hard to deal with because, uh, you know, this philosopher Cressida Hayes writes in her, in her entry on this, uh, it's such an incredibly loaded phrase and it has such an extremely wide reference that it's really hard to tie down. So it's difficult to construct a precise objection as to what identity politics it wants to do or is doing or what it stands for, or what it holds. And it means so many different things to different people. I mean, I mean, I were talking about, sometimes I even think about it as something that's really deep inside of us and, and a pre kind of philosophical understanding. Um, I gave the example from Cavell, Cavell's reading of Wittgenstein. He said that Wittgenstein was attacking the urge to do bad philosophy, you know? Identity politics seems like prior to the theorization, right? It's kind of urge that, you, that we give into. Um, in other ways, I, tie, I try to, analyze it as a technique of power in, say, the Foucauldian sense, right? Instead of it being, say, one theory, it's a multiple set of mechanisms and techniques and procedure for power. Um, now, but the, the overall critique of identity politics will carry over to intersectionality, privilege theory, et cetera, et cetera, is that each of them have to work by sort of subjective, at least subjectivating identities and enforcing certain rigid lines of character, categorization, right? So, and so no matter which way you cut it, it's going to always have some sort of counterinsurgent basis because, you know, you have to start from these rigid lines of identity and then get these systems moving. All right. Uh, on the flip side, the insurgent side, the insurrectionary side would be the shedding of those identities, the breaking down of those borders. Um, and this is why in the talk I referred to it as the most sophisticated sector of the police or, you know, uh, the most sophisticated sector of the police apparatus or the modality of the police, right? And some of this I'm getting from Deleuze as well, right? You know, he always argues in A Thousand Plateaus and, and uh, uh, Anti-Oedipus that whenever you have these kind of orders, they're easier to control, right? Um, so every time that uh, identity is trapped and just so and combined and captured within the state apparatus, they're also easier to control, et cetera. So, what I tried to propose instead of just being wholly negative about being against intersectionality and privilege theory, et cetera, et cetera, is uh, to look at Tony K. Barbera's book. Uh, she had a collection called Black Women in 1970. She was published and she wrote an excellent preface. And I suggest everyone read it. They get a chance. You can get it on, on uh, LibGen now. Um, she never tried to define Black women. Uh, and, and Black women is a very interesting topic because that's what intersectionality starts out with. But she never... She never looks at intersecting oppressions. She never looks at people on the margins of two hierarchies. You know, she's going to argue that Black women ought to be conceptualized as an open possibility, all right, and understood through their struggle and their struggles and their revolutionary activity and their agency, all right. So she kind of starts at the exact opposite of what intersectionality is doing and works in a completely different direction. Um, so, and I think in general with Black people, we can say that, you know, it would be just wrong to say that Black people are, can be defined by an accumulation of their oppressions, right? Oppressions imposed from the outside. Um, so 
what's more, uh, with identity pro uh, politics and intersectionality privilege, the other argument that I had against it or the other objection was that none of them have the resources to account for what I call the morbid libidinal economy of race dynamics. So I began speaking about these kind of terrifying libidinal drives and desires because I observed that, you know, especially after 2020, there was endless talk about race, endless talk about white supremacy, white privilege, uh, you know, uh, black radical tradition, black liberation, et cetera, et cetera. There was so much talk about race, but it seems that there was always something that was notably, notably absent, right? And really off limits, right? A kind of taboo. Um, also, uh, following Robert Bernascotti, the philosopher of race, you know, he repeatedly emphasizes that race and sex are irrevocably linked, right? So we're starting to reach something uh, like a certain unsaid, unsaid that's omitted. And when we have reached something like this unsaid, it starts to resemble the Freudian death drive, right? Or more rigorously, it functions like the traumatic kernel we find in Lacan, right? The, and the, he delineates the three register theory and the register of the real is what, you know, we always circle around but never want to touch, right? If we touch it, it'll break us apart, all right? So um, I try to give examples of the uh, morbid libidinal economy. And I started with David Marriott's example. That's where I got the reading of uh, Baldwin from. And, uh, or at least he was, uh, his book is what, you know, kind of led me to go in that direction. Um, you guys know the story now, or do I have to recount it again? Some of you know it, I don't know. Uh, anyway, okay, right. You know, it's kind of like, I was like super hyped when I did it the last time, you know, and then, okay, then let's stop, let's like uh, rewind, a little, uh, rewind a little. So I was like super hyped when I did it the last time in, in uh, Seattle. And then my friend came up to me and was like, yo, great talk, you know, but how am I gonna explain this to my teenage kids who I brought here? I'm like, Ugh, you know? So uh, in brief, um, you know, you have a white heterosexual couple in this story, in this Baldwin story. Uh, the setting consists of the, the, the man is a redneck cop. He's laying in bed with his wife. He's suffering from impotence. You know, he's unable to perform. And you know, what's more psychoanalytic than impotence, all right? Uh, the spoiler alert is that, you know, he begins to think of his boy had attendance at a lynching, right? Uh, and as we know, lynchings are always exceedingly sexualized rituals of white supremacy, right? The corpse of the black man is not just mutilated, but it's sexually mutilated. Uh, and upon remembering the sexual mutilation, uh, the, the cop is able to achieve erection. Um, so, uh, I compared this Baldwin story to the real life murder of Ahmaud Arbery. And I still think this holds, you know, maybe we could work this through a little bit more, but it's obvious to me that there was some kind of libidinal desires motivating those rednecks down in Atlanta, right? You know, uh, they were getting something out of it, you know, uh, they could have just sat their ass on the porch. So, um, and, and of course that's never talked about. You don't hear, uh, I don't know, what's the guy's name? Um, Don Lemon talking about the morbid libidinal drives of those rednecks down there, right? <laughs> Uh, so, and it, it's uncomfortable to talk about for a lot of reasons, right? And it's also, you know, uh, you also have to admit that, one would have to admit that, you know, all heterosexual white males in America have some similar impulses, right? And that why, that's why it makes us uncomfortable as well, right? Uh, I was, you know, debating whether I'd say this, but, you know, uh, I moved from New York City to the University of New Mexico, and, you know, the weirdest thing was not so much, you know, being the only black person there, but was how much attention, you know, like white men, white heterosexual men would just always be like, like following me or, you know, their eyes were always following me around. Um, uh, but on a general level, you know, our society also it associates black suffer with gratification, right? And that's another way we can approach this. Um, additionally, uh, a lot of the influence or a lot of my understanding of this morbid libidinal economy came from Hortez Spiller's work. I think she does the best work on this. And, uh, and you know, her text, Mama's Babies, Papa's, Papa's Maybe, right? That's right. Yeah, it's groundbreaking, right? So, um, for instance, she gives, uh, she gives a really fascinating uh, interpretation of um, Harriet Jacobs autobiography, right? And she, in that part in the book, Jacob recounts uh, how, you know, she's undergoing incessant sexual harassment from the plantation owner, right? And with this unwanted attention precipitates the jealousy of the master's wife. And in the quiet of the night, you know, the jealous mistress begins to enter Jacob's slave quarters and speaks to her while she's sleeping. If you remember this part, it happens in, I think, chapter six or something like this. Um, 
and it's this murderous voice of envy, right? And Jacobs is like, she, she's going to kill me, right? And the voice enters into both her manifest and latent content of her dream, right? So you have, you know, classic psychoanalytic instance. Um, and the mistress also begins to mimic the voice of seduction of her husband, husband and also the threats, right? It's a little bit of both, right? So Spiller's concludes, and I'm just going to quote her because it's perfect. Um, she says that in a conclusion about this, this passage, in both the male and female instances, the subject attempts to inculcate his or her will into the vulnerable supine, i.e. slave body. We might say that Jacobs, between the lines, demarcates sexuality that is neuter bound, inasmuch as it represents an open vulnerability, a gigantic sexualized repertoire that may be alternatively exposed male and female or male slash female. Since gendered female exists for male, we might suggest that ungendered female in an amazing stroke of pansexual potentiality might be invaded, raided by another woman or man, all right? So basically her, her conclusion is that this degendering of black flesh serves as the foundation for the white gender binary, right? Which only exists for whites in her view. Um, so it's not always about life and death. I think the, again, there's like always uh, the, the less, um, you know, exaggerated instance of this, right? You know, and you could think of times where, you know, you'll see a white friend, a white girlfriend, a white and black girlfriend, you know, friends, and then like the white girl's like, yo, I'm so cool, I'm so hip hop now, right? And like subtly, uh, these subtle ways they manipulate their black friend and friendships, right? Um, I think it's really prevalent and woke activist circles, right? So it's something that's not gonna be talked about. Um, the reading also shows that, you know, gender and race are way more complicated than the three calculuses can really account for. All right? um, you know, for Spiller, the account of black gender and black female gender paradoxically involves a degendering, right? So, you know, then, you know, something like privilege theory or intersectionality, you know, where it becomes one plus minus, it's just not gonna work here. Um, also, there's another instance, and maybe you guys can help me with this, right? Joy James, in a talk I did with her and Shaman Salam and Wendy Trevino, she said there's another account of a whipping in uh, incidents of a slave girl where the morbid libidinal economy comes up, where Jacobs is very frightened or kind of disgusted by uh, a naked slave, male slave body. Um, so maybe we can talk about that. Um, but anyway, what psychoanalysis teaches us, right? And it's very interesting that Jacob says, you know, uh, uh, that Spiller says Jacobs had invented psychoanalysis 30 years before, 40 years before Freud had, right? Or arrived at the real conclusions. Um, but uh, what psychoanalysis teaches us is that whatever is strategically left out and omitted stands at the core of the truth of the system as a whole, right? That real is what, is what structures the system. So, uh, and that's why uh, uh, Lacan was always, say, Lacan always argued that, you know, we always go around it because that's what's holding everything together. Um, so that, and this accounts for the kind of defense mechanisms against it. You know, we block, we block ourselves in various ways from touching the real, whether symbolically or, you know, or, you know, in, with our material bodies, right? Um, but what I want to say is the end of the kind of white deputization that we see, say, in the Ahmad Arbery case is only going to come by traversing that symptom, right? To getting at the real core of the symptom. Um, so... We have the black leadership one. I won't discuss this one since we, uh, uh, since that was already in the video. We can talk about the video if you like. But um, I add in the bottom why he loves property, right? And the idea here was to remind me that um, one of the arguments I made during that part was that there's a special kind of sanctity or prestige that property has in the American case, right? You know, and if if you've ever rioted in another country, it's 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 you know much easier because people just don't care about windows as much, right? Uh, but but um, so, you know, how to account for this kind of sanctity of property. A lot of historians or some historians, John Clegg is one of them, argues that, you know, there's a particular prestige that Property America has due to the fact that it was once alive, right? We had living, walking, being property. Uh, so um, what I find interesting and what I, what I, I have been meaning to develop once I finish my dissertation is that uh, there seems to be this interesting shift now uh, on the one hand from, you know, I was in a minority from hating the police. You know, you couldn't say, especially in New York, you couldn't be like, you know, fuck the cops, right? Someone will slap you. But now 
I think with Generation Z, you know, they kind of all hate the cops now, right? Or at least it's a little bit more open, you know? I mean, yeah. So it's a little, you know, and it, you don't sound like a crazy man by saying, you know, fuck the pigs, right? Uh, but what's interesting to me is now we've gone from like the critique of the state to the fully situationist critique of, you know, anti-work, anti-capitalism with, you know, striketober and people just saying, you know, this kind of critique of work that hasn't been articulated. And I, there has to be a link there in some way, right? Uh, also to even, you know, and I'm gonna just get myself in trouble, but you know, when you're, when over that summer when we were riding, you know, or when people were riding and I was observing, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it would be this continual return to the, the police, the cop shop, the cop shop, the pig pen, we'd keep going back, at least in Seattle, when I was there in Seattle. And, you know, it was just this small step to saying, okay, well, the cops protect the property. When are we just gonna go get the property instead, right? So there's a link that needs to be drawn out there. This one I need to work on too, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, I'll get there at some point. Um, so my hero, Simone Vale, always argues that, you know, war is never fully external. It's all, it, it always has an internal dimension on the, play, on the people who are waging war, all right? So, um, you know, what I was coming to notice and especially leading up to the pandemic is that, you know, all these kind of problems that America shifted onto the per colonial periphery, we're starting to come back and, you know, the, the classic Malcolm X chickens come home to roost, right? And I wanted to give an account of that somehow, and I'll get to it at some time to fully get it structured out. But uh, how, I want, how, I, how I see it at least in sketch and broad sketches is that uh, both with Foucault and Agamben, you have biopolitical security, and then you have the sovereign state, right? And, uh, the sovereign state is always an individual state or it tends to be an individual state. And then you have biopolitical security, which is a global network, right? But, you know, America is in a strange position because, you know, it's a, an imperial state that reaches out, but also going to be a part of this global network, all right? So maybe to some extent that would explain this kind of internalization of war, internalization of uh, all the kind of things that America foisted onto other countries in the global south. Um, also, there, there's been uh, uh, um, some scholars have argued that you know Agamben never has gotten a real uh, has never really gone the length needed to really kind of reconcile the two right and some people have argued that Junger's total mobilization uh, is a good way to explain how uh, how war comes back home right and uh, his line was that war uh, that what what marks modern war of course is the biopolitical uh, clash between populations, but also the fact that the population needs to be mobilized, right? And this mobilization occurs much more behind the front as it does on the front line itself, right? And then that same mobilization can be used later for say, uh, putting down a strike or in a crisis or the war on COVID or the war on drugs or the war on terror, right? Um, and of course, we're starting, of course, we've seen now the shift from the war on terror to the war on COVID. And even uh, Andrew Lakoff, the, the medical anthropologist argues that even, kind of banal terms, like essential worker, definitely comes from Cold War. Uh, you know, these are the workers that we need to have to survive a, a, a nuclear blast, right? Um, what's more, I, I, I wanted to argue, or at least one of the ways I looked at this was that, you know, what Foucault says about the security state or security is that it's a framework that doesn't block the event, but it lets the event happen and tries to optimize it, right? And with Lakoff's preparedness paradox, he argues that, you know, whenever, uh, we prepare for an event and then the event doesn't happen. And then we stop preparing for the event and then it does occur, right? And we can kind of see it now with, uh, with Omicron, I guess. You know, um, one of the things he argues is that uh, there's a reluctance for countries to report that they found a new strain, right? Of whatever virus, right? Before COVID, right? Like H1N1, et cetera, et cetera. Because when they do it, they're penalized. So then in the next round, no one's gonna do it, right? So it, it becomes impossible to prepare for the next pandemic. Um, and so, if the event has to be admitted through security, then this kind of Lakoff's paradox kind of shows why, you know, we periodically get these things that go out of control of, say, the maintenance and optimization by the state. Uh, next, boom. Uh, this was the one about Haiti, right? Uh, the idea was that instead of uh, taking the extreme left-wing view now that, that's changed out of nowhere, uh, to being partisans of security and uh, um, supporters of security and biopolitical control, or on the right, kind of this conspiratorial 
uh, denialism of the facticity of the virus. You know, there needs to be some other way of understanding it, right? And this is very much an open question. My, uh, my, from the example that I tried to pull was the example of uh, the Haitian rebellion and the Haitian revolution, right? There was the story of um, the, the slaves in Haiti were well aware of yellow fever the time it comes around. They had developed immunity. They had developed ways of treating it for themselves, right? So when Napoleon's huge army landed on the shores of Haiti, you know, they knew that they weren't going to be prepared to deal with yellow fever, and that's when they, they launched their guerrilla attacks, right? So um, in a way, this is kind of like in the end of security territory population of Foucault's 77 lectures. He talks about these kind of counterconducts and, and knowledges, you know, in the Middle Ages of, of medicine uh, that were lost, or Federici's Caliban and the Witch, or um, uh, uh, Carlo Ginsberg, my favorite book, um, uh, Cheese and Worms, right, of the, of the Miller who knows all this kind of uh, um, kind of secret knowledge that is only dispersed around the proletariat. Um, so this is what uh, I was aiming for here, right? Um, it's the hardest to do because you know you don't want to discount fully um, all the scientific knowledge that we've been using to deal with the event. Uh, the one uh, great contribution is from there's a, a a biophysicist named Sonali Gupta who wrote in a I think it's Eflux. It's called Virality and she takes up the problem straight from how it might should be done and says, okay, how are we going to think about this without going to the two extreme poles of, you know, total fear or total denial, yeah. right? I think she's working in Urbana Champlain in the, in the biophysics department there. Um, next we have eight. Um, this is the more blankiest one. And I think you guys read to our friends at, uh, you guys read to our friends during uh, uh, class, right? And there's a part, and this is really influenced by that text in the sense that at one point they say, okay, we're not going to talk about means of production. This is an old way of understanding things. The real point is controlling, destroying, or uh, uh, the controlling infrastructure, right? Or even, um, you know, it's, it's weird to talk about Bonanno in a place like this, but Alfredo Bonanno often talks about, uh, uh, you know, just the materiality of things and not so much, you know, the value of production in the Marxist way. All right. So, um, and also Blanqui's going through a kind of, uh, uh, you know, Peter Hallward's new book on Blanqui. He's being revived. It's not just a bad word anymore to be called a Blanquiist, right? So there's a certain technical dimension to revolution uh, that an insurrection that I wanted to pull out at that time uh, to think about what's the equivalent of the telephone exchange in uh, the CNT fought over that in May of 37 in Spain or, um, uh, in 1905 and in 1917, in the St. Petersburg Railway was a big, a very hotly contested thing, and not because of value production, but because of what it did for uh, communication, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, what else did I want to say about that? Uh, you know, and at the time, too, I was even reading um, uh, a lot of books on how to, and how to uh, you know, pull through a coup. I forgot the guy's name, this, like, kind of... Uh, Oh, damn. Anyway, right. The problem was is that the other problem that you face is that, at least I faced is that even you know doing a coup in America just seems kind of like insane because it's such a big place, right? You know, and uh, there's only and there's all these complexities of like taking the TV station, taking the phone state, you know, da 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 da. That you can do in a small place, but in a big place like America, it poses a lot of problems. So this leads to this, uh, the next one, Civil War. What happened? Oh, there we go. OK. So this one is materialized the ever-present specter of a second, more balkanized civil war by fragmenting the fragments of a crumbling empire. All right. So um, at least in radical revolutionary circles, or whatever you want to call it, leftist circles, or whatever, this one, I think, was one of the most controversial and contested. Uh, people didn't like talking about civil war. and. Just to be frank, right? It was mainly white readers who really didn't like uh, talking about civil war, and I think there's a reason for this. Um, uh, and and I'll talk more about Nicole Larue's uh, analysis of civil war, but she argues that uh, civil war is always this repressed kernel in society, uh, and it, it's kind of this trauma that's repressed in a very psychoanalytic way. Um, so my initial reasons for taking up the question of second civil war was that it was just constantly being put on the table, right? Uh, for us academics or, you know, Parsons, the left, et cetera, et cetera, we tend not to read just, you know, the normal sources that other people are reading or, you know, but 
it was kind of everywhere in 2020, if you looked around, right? Uh, especially, you know, throughout the Trump presidency, civil war was what was, was just kind of almost a mainstream topic. And even now, if you open up an editorial, say like, I don't know, the Post or the Daily News, you'll find stuff on it. So I felt that it was something that needed to be addressed if it was on people's minds. Um, and I argued also, and this comes back to the question of the size and the immensity and the complexity of America, that civil war also would facilitate in breaking down America into sizable chunks to deal with it in a revolutionary way. Uh, the, 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 the usual objection to this is saying, OK, well, China and Russia. But we have to remember that during the Chinese Revolution, during the Russian Revolution, they were largely feudal countries, right? You know, And so you know, something in America with this much technological progress on top of its size, there's really no historical precedent for this. Um, so I argued that the fracturing of America would facilitate revolution. Uh, and then, you know, we could put back smaller puzzle pieces together later, right? Um, I tried to read this into Harry Haywood. Uh, you know, he wrote Black Bolshevik. And he also had the Black Belt thesis. He was the chairman of the Communist Party uh, in the 40s till, till, I think, 53, right? And uh, his argument was that the, the South should be an independent Soviet state, a black Soviet state, uh, kind of in the way that, like, say, Kyrgyzstan or Georgia was in the Soviet Union, these kind of satellite states. And, um, and then the North would be uh, a socialist state for, uh, for white people. Um, now, where am I at now? No. No. Let's see. So, what I what I also okay. Oh yeah, here, here it is. Here it is. The other thing that uh, I found that led me to talk about civil war was that literally when being in the Northwest, it just felt like a civil war. <laughs> uh, and I don't know how it played out here, but. Um, you know, I'm, again, I'm from New York City, and we, like guns are illegal, right? But you know, so I would go to demos, and I'd see people carrying guns on both sides, and I'd be like, oh, all right. Um, you know, so carrying in demonstrations, you know, hiding uh, in bushes when demonstrations were going on, and then you know, especially with the Portland thing was going on at that time too, with the the federal troops, and it was becoming like, you know, every day Portland was doing the demos, and then people were coming from rural. Uh, from rural Oregon and kind of invading in, and you know it was you know a lot of gunplay out there. So it felt like it had dimensions of civil war, and that's why I put that in there as well. That's why I thought it was it was needed to address it. Um, now uh, back to Nicole Larue, the French classicist, right? Uh, how I wanted now, how I want to go, the direction I want to go is through her account of stasis in her book *Divided Cities*, right? The Greek term stasis as civil war, and uh, you know Greek is very polysemic, right? It carries, uh, at least ancient Greek is, right? Um, so it carries the, you know, it carries much more uh, than just civil war, meaning it's much more than civil war. It's factional conflict, partisanship, sedition, has all these meanings in Greek, right? But what I found interesting initially about LaRue's uh, account of civil war in the ancient world is that there's analogous currents to the abolitionist current and the suffragist current in ancient Greece, at least according to her arguments, or, um, which you know we know uh, showed themselves during the Civil War. Also, again, she takes Civil War to have the same status as the psychoanalytic real, right? And a lot of her analysis speaks about you know why is it that in the ancient world, once the Civil War is over, there's always these kind of uh, agreements never to talk about the past, right? Um, there and following Larue and Agamben, Agamben also really likes Larue. There's a sort of uh, politicization of the private realm, she argues, and a depoliticization of the public realm of the public sphere. So domestic and civil life they start to bleed in each other. The oikos and the police they become rendered kind of indistinguishable. So, um, and I think we can see this in the country today. And this is this is what I argued in uh, the Revista de Sensa art article, but. Um, you know, there's a kind of abolitionist overcoming of whiteness that implies this fracturing of the family. And, you know, ever since Trump, uh, a white friend will tell me, you know, I went home for like Thanksgiving. And, you know, after having, uh, after talking to my uncle, I told him I'm going to kill him when the revolution comes, right? My racist <laughs> uncle, you know? So it's happening, right? You know? Uh, and, you know, again and again, you know, it's playing out. So, uh, but, you know, on, on, on more general terms, Black liberation does entail sort of forsaking of white lineage of, of the lineage of whiteness, right? And that's what's going on at the dinner table. Um, so, hence the banal kind of off-repeated saying that civil wars are a clash of brother versus brother. And 
this is probably why most it was uh, it became so uh, uh, the you know it was such a taboo or or controversial for my white friends when they read or white readers when they read this part they really didn't like the Civil War part. Um, uh, Shaman Salam even argues that Civil War is you know should be fought within whiteness itself, right? It should be an explosion of whiteness from within. James Bogg says the same. I mean, he has a little bit more complex one. He argues that you know Civil War is white versus white, uh, black versus white, but black versus black as well, right? So it's kind of breaking up like this. Um, uh, on the other side, you know, so we have this kind of politicization of the family, right? Uh, the politicization of the oikos. But then you have, you know, the, the for me, the slave plantation is the paradigmatic instance of oikonomia, right? It's a this kind of a state that, you know, and this is where economy comes from, but it's a productive state you know, with a family structure within it, right? So it's everything that the private realm was for the ancient Greeks, right? Um, so, I mean, I think it's obvious that many aspects of American society reflect or exhibit relations that were formally invested within the system of plantations, right, in the state. So especially these libidinal relationships spill over to public view, right? The, the family romances that took on a terrifying turn in the plantations now play out in the public sphere. So we have these two sides, right? And this is the part of Civil War. Uh, I, I work a lot on uh, destituent power. And um, you know what I argue is destituent power is the breaking of these binds that keep the oikos and the, and the public sphere together, right? When they blend each other, they, they, they blend in each other, and then they're unraveling. Um, also, I wanted to put the Battle of Antietam down there. I didn't, I'm going to say a little bit about that. but. Uh, you know, there's a Yale historian, his name's eluding me right now, but, you know, he argues that, you know, at Antietam, you know, there was the most carnage ever on American soil, probably the most lives lost on both sides. There's no decisive tactical victory in Antietam, right? It's just carnage, right? Uh, one of the arguments against Civil War was like, oh, we'll lose, but, um, you know, in that case, in, in the Civil War, it's interesting to know that they did these, like, old Napoleonic charges, right, with, with very modern weapons, right? So it was just, it was carnage due to the tactics, not even so much the weapons. But uh, um, he argues that, you know, the carnage that occurred on the battlefield on both sides led Lincoln to, uh, uh, gave Lincoln the kind of leeway to push through emancipation, right? But the interesting thing he argues is that no one from Lincoln to the Northern soldiers was in favor of emancipation, right? And he's like, sometimes history jumps ahead of its actors, right? And then I find that pretty interesting way to look at the Civil War, right? Um, and it goes also into the next part on, on whiteness and martyrdom. Oh, damn. OK, that's better. That's that off. Here we go. All right. So this is the last one, the kind of political theology one, right? Thesis 10, the fulfillment of the revolutionary project is ultimately an inescapable obligation that each of us have to the dead and the exploited. And what I've been working with more is trying to understand martyrdom. Uh, and it continues to be a pressing question, right? Uh, there's a martyrdom of, uh, I have them up here, Jojo Bowen and uh, Anthony Huber, right? They were killed in, in Kenosha, um, you know, with Kyle Rittenhouse getting off for it, you know, so their martyrdom is now in the popular consciousness in some way, all right? And um, I began to address the letter more seriously, the, the topic more seriously with the letter to Reinhold that you can find on Ill Will. Uh, that's him over here, right? And um, he was hunted down and assassinated by federal agents in the Pacific Northwest, right? This story. And I compared him to John Brown, right? I should have used the other picture, right? Uh, there's a picture of him during the Vice interview and that look of fear in his eye. And it just reminded me of that classic picture in the eyes of John Brown, right? So I compared them uh, that once it struck me that you know there's some sort of similarity there. Um, Stefano Harney wrote me and, and, and told me, uh, sent me some literature on this. And W. Du Bois arrived at very similar conclusions uh, about John Brown that I did in the Reinhold article. Uh, which I was shocked, right? And of course, W. Du Bois did it much better than I, much elegantly than I will ever do, right? But um, in the right when I was on the plane flying here, I actually found uh, he wrote in 1909, the same year, a shorter text called John uh, John Brown and Christmas, right? And it fits because it's December. Um, so <laughs> it's a little strange, but hear me out, all right? So he writes that uh, he says, "This is Christmas time. This is Du Bois. This is Christmas time and the time of John Brown." On the second of this month, i.e. December, he was crucified 
On the 8th, he was buried. And on the 25th, 50 years later, let him rise from the dead in every Negro American home. Jesus came not to bring peace, but a sword. And so did John Brown. So, uh, you know, and, and these kind of, uh, this understanding of martyrdom has been something I've been working with uh, and trying to flesh it out in a more theoretical way as well, right? There's, I guess, that, that, that little poem or, or passage that Du Bois wrote, there's some things problematic with it. And, but I, I've been trying to sort of, in the same way that when Benjamin writes in the critique of violence that he wants to strip out these certain, you know, Christian baggage and get to the Jewish core of, uh, of, of the critique of, of political theology. This is what I've been trying to do. And uh, so kind of all these like Greek and Roman influences that he detects in Christianity, he wants to kind of pull them out. Um, Agamemnon does the same thing in a different way, I think. And um, uh, Jakob Tobes, when they argue that Paul is really should be understood as a Jewish figure. Um, so relying on Benjamin's notion of pure and divine violence, you know, I tried to explain the act of self-defense that Reinhold was uh, persecuted for, right? So in this critique, in Benjamin's critique, he insists that, you know, uh, that self-defense, even though there's the, the fundamental commandment, thou shalt not kill, it doesn't hold for self-defense. And it's important for people to wrestle with, you know, what it means to be, what it means to take someone's life and contravene that commandment. Um, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, uh, John Brown was such a religious person, of course, he had to wrestle with this internally, right? And um, what Benjamin goes to argue is that there's something, there's something just more valuable to a good and just existence than, say, just existence alone, right? This kind of sanctity of life, this humanitarian sanctity of life, there's always something more than that, and that's justice itself, right? And in seeking that justice, whether it's in, which is beyond life and death, whether your life or someone else's life, the martyr transforms themselves. And in this context, in our context, I think this transformation is what it means to be, uh, is to be a traitor of the white race, right? That's the abolitionist project. Uh, and they coincide with martyrdom. Um, another thing I was putting up too is in studying martyrdom, I've been going back to this Perpetua and Felicity, right? Um, and Polycarp, these kind of old early Christian martyrs is something I've been looking at as well to try to really pull out the theological core of this because martyrdom is so misunderstood and it brings up so many connotations in people's heads that they tend to argue, uh, you know, you're, a lot of the arguments that at least I got about it were, you know, about someone's perception of martyrdom after, of course, 10 years of Islamophobia, right? So, uh, you know, in the West, there's just a real resistance to assuming self-sacrifice, right? Uh, now, the theoretical side of it, too, that I've been looking into takes up the work of the Palestinian Chilean philosopher, Rodrigo Carmi Bolton. All right? And people, should, if, if you check him out, he's, he's really dope. Uh, he comes out of uh, the 2019 uprising as well, right? Um, and he's a, a scholar of Islamic, uh, of thir like medieval Islamic thought. Uh, he does a lot of stuff on Avicenna, but he wrote a great article on martyrdom. And he kind of, uh, you know, he kind of takes up the project that I want to take up where, how can we think of a martyrdom that's not fully sacrificial, but you know, also we need something that I think we need to go past this kind of hedonism of 68, right? So Bolton explains, Carmi Bolton explains that the martyr is someone who is totally immersed in revolt, right? And that immersion in revolt is, uh, any, anyone who's participated in a revolt knows that in an uprising, historical time kind of stops and it gets, time gets jarred, literary time gets kind of broken up. And Bolton's gonna argue that the martyr becomes unwilling and able to conceive and unable to conceive of the ramifications of his or her actions outside of that insurrectionary moment, right? Time is so jarred by the uprising that it can, uh, that person can only conceive of what's going on within the moment itself. So they become, you know, they, things like their physical, psychological, financial well-being, all these things that the status quo tells us that are important just become worthless to them because they can't see outside of that revolutionary, that revolutionary moment, that insurrectionary moment. And this is, I think, the theoretical underpinning to that Pasolini uh, slogan. Well, it's a civil rights slogan that Pasolini loved, right? You have to throw your body into the struggle, right? You give everything to the struggle. You immerse yourself in the struggle. And um, to quote Carmi, he says that in daring to revolt, the risking of one's life or one's own person on the incalculable intensity of insurrection implies uh, forging a link between the mythic and the political, the eternity of a mobile time, and the contingency of history. So, you know, he 
gives us a, a way to understand, to rigorously account for the way that the old saying that martyrdom is a gift, right? You surrender a life that's plagued by injustice or a bare life for something immeasurably greater or more value, valuable, you know, the good, humanity, right? And it's a change of the self. Um, so when I was writing How Might You Be Done, I, I, or when I did How Might You Be Done, I ended by speaking of these kind of historical wrongs that need to be righted and the revenge for the dead and the dead of the struggle, but also the dead of uh, the oppressed who never had a moment of freedom, right? And, you know, what I wanted to say here now and to end this off is when we heed the, their screams for vengeance, we also fulfill ourselves, right? It's a twofold thing. It's not just fully sacrificial. So, you know, to partake in their struggles, to partake in that kind of eternal life that they've created. So, uh, so finally, allowing the, dead allowing the dead to rest, I messed up the last time too, is the only way we can put our own souls at ease. All right, that's it. <laughs>